You've probably heard of them. Career criminals. Career criminals. Repeat criminals. Repeat offenders. Super predator. Super predators. Professional criminals. Career criminals, chronic offenders, super predators, or whatever fun nicknames are in the news this week. They are scary, they are everywhere, and they are coming for someone you love unless you vote for the right person this November. So today, let's talk about chronic offenders. Where this idea comes from, along with all the name calling. What does a society look like with chronic offenders, career criminals, super predators, jumbo, felons? Yeah, that works. What, what does that even mean? And what does this have to do with what everyone, including myself, gets wrong about crime? So normally, when talking about a topic on this show, I explain how most people see the issue outside prison versus how I experienced the issue while I was locked up inside prison. The great thing about this topic is that to understand it, you do not have to set foot inside a prison, nor do you even have to be arrested, as proven by Marvin E. Wolfgang, Robert M. Fiblio, and Thorsten Sellen in their 1979 study, Delinquency in a Birth Cohort. We are going to be talking about this birth cohort study a lot during this episode. So what does that even mean? A cohort in a study is a group of people with something in common. Let's say you're studying the effects of overly loud engines in local communities. You could contact every motorcycle dealership in the country. You could find out who purchased a motorcycle in the past year, and you could then create a biker cohort. Maybe you want to find out how many people are really interested in personal experience criminal justice stories. You might contact all the subscribers to the Shakedown podcast and you'd find a really cool cohort. You get it? It's the something in common with that group. The cohort study I'll be talking about for the rest of the episode was based on every male born in 1945 and living in Philadelphia between the ages of 10 and 18, which is what the researchers refer to as a birth cohort. Okay, back to it. Before this study, there had been many studies on the etiology, the causes of crime. You probably have heard some of the results. Some studies say that criminality is directly correlated to your environment. The more violent and unstable your neighborhood, the more likely you are to become a criminal. Some say the factors are more genetic, uh, that certain types of people are predisposed to committing crime. And yes, whenever you hear the term genetic or evolutionary, there's going to be a certain group of scientists who are specifically talking about race and ethnicity. In the 1800s, Early criminologists went so far as to argue over whether bumps on your head or nose size more accurately predicted whether you would become a criminal. Interesting how, to this day, we still talk about Jewish noses. Criminologists still argue about the causes and determining factors of crime to this day. The closest thing researchers have found to a determining factor is age. The younger a person is, the more likely they are to commit a crime, no matter their background, biology, or environment. The birth cohort study was not about the causes of crime. The study was actually meant to look at the causes of recidivism. Why do people commit more crimes and who is committing it? A pretty simple question and, as it turns out, a really important one. So why does recidivism matter? Well first, it tells you if all crimes are committed by different people or if they're committed by one singular deviant running around undermining all of society. I mean, imagine if all we had to do to stop crime was just arrest one single person. And if crime is committed by different people, well then studying recidivism would tell us what we can do to prevent crime once someone is arrested. Okay, I know this is my own like weird personal fantasy, but what if? Okay, just, just hang with me here. Okay, what if after we arrested someone, what if we worked with the person and tried to ensure that they never committed another crime? Hold on, hold on. We could figure out what motivated them to commit the crime, what might have prevented it, and what part of their environments were affecting the behavior. And 
like diagnose behavioral issues that might have contributed to it. And maybe even, maybe look at systemic issues and make changes where necessary. We could even try to prevent someone else from going through the exact same process which led to the criminal behavior. I know, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's really crazy because it'd be so much easier just to say this. I think we've gotta to be tough on crime. We need to get these criminals off the streets. We're tough on crime and tougher on criminals. Enough is enough. It's time to get these hardened criminals off the street and into jail. And that the steepest sentences are given to them. You should lock them up. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. It's classic for a reason. Heck, I even had inmates tell me that while we were both locked up. And that's fine and dandy and all, except for what happens when you fill up all the prisons. Or maybe there are so many law-abiding citizens that you'll never fill up a prison, ever. But, what did the study find? You probably already realized that the study didn't find either of the two cases I mentioned before. If all crimes are committed by different people, or if they're committed by one singular deviant running around undermining all of society. We found something in between, but it heavily weighted toward one side of that argument. So only about one third of the cohort had any contact with police. Of that one third, 54% re-offended. Of those re-offenders were recidivists, only 18% offended five times or more. These offenders made up only 6% of the total sample size. This 6% was responsible for 52% of all crime committed by the cohort. Speak on that for just a moment. If the justice system could have prevented the recidivism of just this 6%, crime would have been cut in half. Actually, in more than half. And not just minor offenses. This 6% was responsible for 71% of homicides, 73% of rapes, 82% of robberies, and 69% of aggravated assaults. If you are able to identify and address just this 6%, you wouldn't be taking a bite out of crime, you would be leaving just the crumbs. That was just one study from 1972. Clearly that data is outdated, that study has been debunked, and it's outdated, right? Right? Well, they decided to do the study again with men and women this time. Again, similar results, though women had a smaller number of chronic offenders, which could be for multiple reasons. If you're more interested in that subject, I'd highly suggest looking up women comma crime and women comma power in the United States history books. Results of the cohort study have even been replicated outside the US in different countries. This means that criminals and chronic offenders are the rare few people who end up committing the majority of crimes. Every group studied has had this group within the cohort. They are not a special type of people, they are a description of a statistical portion of a given population. But wait, you might be saying, as you try to dig through my references in the description, I thought career criminals and chronic offenders are, you know, evil. I mean, I just said they run around causing all the crimes. And to that I say, no, no, dear viewer, you were thinking of... Super Predators. At some point, chronic offenders change from a rare form of recidivist to, well, this. When faced with the high crime rate in the 90s, people wanted answers and solutions. And one man was happy to provide both. His name was John DeLulio. I may or may not be pronouncing his name correctly, and I may or may not care, as you'll see why shortly. His answer, instead of referring back to the birth cohort research, looking at the growing population rate and realizing that there may be a growing crime rate because we have a larger overall population, which means a larger 6% of chronic offenders wreaking havoc. Instead, DeLulio explained that this was just an amoral generation of kids, a veritable lord of the flies in real life. This was the generation of super predators. Why? 
because black fathers weren't going to church and raising their children, of course. As you might guess, Delulio's study had a lot more anecdotal evidence and a lot less research than the birth cohort study. Fun fact, Delulio then went on to serve as the first director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives under President George W. Bush. But before that, he put the phrase moral poverty in the media right where the politicians could hear it, and boy, were they listening. Unless we do something about that cadre of young people, tens of thousands of them, born out of wedlock, without parents, without supervision, without any structure, without any conscience developing, because they literally have not been socialized. They literally have not had an opportunity. We should focus on them now. If we don't, they will, or a portion of them will, become the predators 15 years from now. And Madam President, we have predators on our streets that society has, in fact, in part because of its neglect, created. Too many kids don't have parents who care. Gangs and drugs have taken over our streets and undermined our schools. Every day we read about somebody else who has literally gotten away with murder. But the American people haven't forgotten the difference between right and wrong. The system has. The American people haven't stopped wanting to raise their children in lives of safety and dignity. But they've got a lot of obstacles in their way. When I sign this crime bill, we together are taking a big step toward bringing the laws of our land back into line with the values of our people and beginning to restore the line between right and wrong. There must be no doubt about whose side we're on. People who commit crimes should be caught, convicted, and punished. That crime bill led to the United States, a country with 4.23% of the world's population to house 25.5% of the world's incarcerated population, not including people currently on parole, probation, or do not have full right to citizens because they were convicted of crimes. A state of affairs made all the more awful because of one of the other major findings from the cohort study. Okay, for those of you keeping score out there, you may have figured out that the U.S. population is nearly 350 million people right now, and 6% of that is around 19 million people, way more than the 2 million people currently incarcerated in the U.S. The real lesson of the birth cohort study is that we need more prisons. We need to lock up more people. We need to listen to people like this. I blame the criminals. You said violent criminals ought not to be out free on the streets. President Clinton heard you. Now we have three strikes and you're out for violent offenders. We need to leave prosecutors and judges with no choice but to punish those criminals and remove them and their guns from our streets. I want a mandatory minimum sentence. So is that the conclusion of the study? Is that the big reveal for this episode? That the entire time I've been hosting this podcast, I've been promoting prisons. I'm a shill for the prison industry. Wouldn't be the first time an ex-felon's done that. What the birth cohort study finds consistently, what criminology textbooks, including the one I had in college, teach is this. The more severely you punish a chronic offender, the more likely they are to reoffend. I'll repeat myself so you can really grasp the concept. The more severely you punish a chronic offender, the more likely they are to reoffend. And one more time for good measure. The more severely you punish a chronic offender, the more likely they are to reoffend. Remember, this study was not trying to figure out why anyone was offending. It was just trying to figure out what type of person kept on offending despite clear consequences. And believe it or not, the data shows that a person who commits a serious crime despite all consequences one time will not care about consequences 
the second time or any other time. It almost seems like if you make punishment too severe, you'll piss the person off to a point that makes committing crime part of their identity. That last part isn't in the study, but after six years in prison, that's definitely the takeaway that I see. That result is not surprising, considering any Psychology 101 textbook will tell you that punishment is one of the worst ways to modify behavior. What is surprising is that whenever we talk about crime, lessening or heaven forfend, eliminating punishment is seen as heresy. Removing the thing that increases crime is seen as heresy. It's like we're standing behind a locked door and no one knows how to open it. Then the second someone offers to get a key, we burn them as a witch. Here's the great news about fixing the problem. You still get to burn witches. You can still easily judge and point and yell at your TV with righteous indignation, screaming, that is so wrong. You just need to point the indignation in the right direction. Very soon, if not already, there will be a lot of people vying for your vote. There may be a sheriff, city council, congressperson, president of these United States, or supreme chancellor of the galactic prefecture. They will have a stance on crime. And if that stance on crime is in any way tough, then that person does not care about keeping you and your loved ones safe. That person just wants to get you riled up so you will vote in their direction. So it actually helps prevent recidivism. There are lots of theories, but what comes up again and again, even on the Department of Justice's own website is education, employment, and social support. However, all of these things need a big hearty asterisk next to them. Education is helpful if it is relevant to people's lives and careers. The stamp saying GED that will not help a person attain a job or find a home that they can afford is not helpful or relevant. Paying employment outside prison is tremendously helpful and can greatly reduce recidivism. Non-paying jobs, aka slavery, regularly performed inside prisons or as part of work release programs have been proven to have negligible effects or increase recidivism. Social support by mentors who demonstrate healthy behaviors or by people who can offer emotional support and unqualified financial support can make a huge difference in recidivism. Qualified loans, meaning you have to pay them back at a certain time or take classes to earn them. Pawn release can lead someone in an already vulnerable situation into debt and at risk to commit more crimes. The birth cohort and so many other studies show that the ways to prevent crime are with education, employment, and social support. Big asterisk. Harsher and more frequent punishments increase crime. Also, it's immoral, but it's harder for me as a felon to argue morality. Also, people keep trying the morality argument, and for some reason, that isn't enough. So when you get angry, get angry about those jerks who are really making our cities unsafe to live in. The ones yelling, lock them up. Or whenever you see DA McCoy on Law & Order work the legal system to get a harsher conviction, get mad. Tell Dick Wolf where he can stick his copaganda. And when someone explains how they want to take your precious tax dollars and give it to police and prisons because of all that crime, tell them where they can stick their funding into treatment programs, restorative justice initiatives, and community projects. And more about why those actually work in later episodes. So as I wrap up this video today, let me show you some clips from some people who are actually trying to reduce recidivism. You provide somebody with a mentor, just simply someone in your life that's there for you 24-7 through your struggles, through your accomplishments, 
reduces recidivism in a huge way. Connect them to education, job training, workforce, job, even more reduced. If they need therapy, provide it, because this is a population that's experienced severe trauma before prison, in the community, in prison, et cetera. And these things reduce recidivism by 70%. If someone earns a bachelor's degree while incarcerated, recidivism goes down to a little more than five and a half percent. And if they earn a master's degree while incarcerated, recidivism is zero. The group asked me, why is it, Governor, that the recidivism rate is so high? In fact, the longer that they stayed incarcerated, the more likely they were to reoffend. I decided to close down both of these outdated institutions and replace them with smaller community-based centers that focus on therapy, training, and education. Today, I am proud to say that our population of incarcerated youth has been cut now by two-thirds. Norway's liberal attitude to justice has been mocked as an oddball social experiment, but it is getting results. In the United States, reoffending rates are 77 percent. In Norway, it's 20 percent. An international benchmark helped by prisons like Bastoy which has a reoffending rate of just 16%. Thanks for stopping by and checking out this episode. Uh, if you are listening on the podcast, definitely stop by the YouTube channel and check this episode out for some additional content. Uh, there are plenty of reference materials in the description as well if you want to see my sources uh, for this episode. For longtime listeners or new listeners, I'm trying out a new format. Let me know in the comments what you think. And if there's any other topics you want me to discuss, I would also like to send a shout out to some other channels that really inspired me to try out this format and see how it works. There's some more news, Skip Intro, Mooncat, Folding Ideas, H Bomber Guy, and Zoe B. If you have not checked out these channels, which honestly is very unlikely because these channels get a lot more views than I do. They are incredibly well thought out, well put together uh, video essays, and they tend to put them out on the regular. They are excellent. Definitely go check them out. There will be links in the description. So enjoy. And they, some of them even have very relevant videos to this topic as well. If you haven't yet, please like this video, subscribe to the channel. And if you really like, head over to our Patreon, link is in the description so that we can keep make, making these. Another link that is in, in the description, waywardpress.com, where you can get awesome merch like this shirt and some of the other shirts I was wearing throughout this video that you may or may not have noticed. Um, you may have to watch it again, see all the cool shirts I was wearing and pick one out. And as a reward for all you devoted YouTube fans who watch this whole video. Here is a video of a beagle learning to climb down the stairs for the very first time. severely you punish a chronic offender, the more likely they are to reoffend. The more 